Now, I've seen you play. I've seen some tape, and I think uh, you know you had to work obviously hard to get where you're at. But I think mm-hmm. you also the way you played, you had this scrappy, just no holds barred. I mean, talk about the way you you competed with Kobe. Yeah. Tell me, how do you own how do you own your faith through all that? Because it's set. You know, there's there's such this line. Mm-hmm. Like I think if if we were to look at not know Mike and look at him on the court, be like, man, that guy, he's 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 got a screw loose. <laughs> You know, I think you played yeah. with that edge. How, how was how did you balance that with with kind of owning your faith and hey, I got I this is the way I need to play to to be effective. Yeah, good question. Um, well, there were times when I didn't do it well. And, you know, there was I, I think um, when I think back to it, I mean, there are times when you obviously when you when you play at that level from for a guy like me and for all the NBA players really, when everybody raises their game, it, it is a little bit crazy. I mean, there's an element of of physicality with no pads that you've got to be able to push through. There's scratching and bleeding and banging and bumping. And so there's, there's a, there's a mental and physical toughness that has to be in there. And there's a, there's a desire to want to take somebody out if you have to. Now it's a game. It's not life, Mm -hmm. you know? So to be able to walk off those lines and know that I'm not, I don't need to do anything. It, it, it all stayed on the floor. Like that was pushed to me at a young age. So um, when you walk on the floor and um, most of my life, I would say 80% of my life as a basketball player, when I walked on the floor, the comment was, I'll guard this little blankety blank white boy. So there was never a instant respect. Mm-hmm. And it happened even in my ninth year in Europe where – I'll take this little blankety blank white guy. So, not hard to have a chip on your shoulder. Somebody yeah. said it to me, I'm, guess what? I'm going to score on you. You're going to remember this blankety blank white boy. <laughs> and you might end up on the ground the yeah. whole game. Yeah. Got no problem with that. So, it raises your intensity to a point where I didn't have any problem trying to hurt you. No problem. It's part of the game. And if you don't make it, you don't make it out, that's your problem. So... <laughs> But I'm still gonna I'm still gonna do what I can to win and and uh, so it it was it when you it's hard it's again this is hard to explain that but like that's I didn't feel like I was crossing any lines because it was a game mm. um, and that was that was told to me I remember playing I remember having a hard time my freshman year in in college with that battle you know yeah and um, the only way I was going to um, be able to compete with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength for the Lord. It was going to have to be all in. And then I was going to just mature as a person. Mm-hmm. And then I remember, uh, you know, John MacArthur was our president of our school. I remember he called me to his house and he said, I see you're struggling a little bit. Because there were games when I'd play 35 points and the next game I'd have like 10. Mm-hmm. And I would think, well, I'm just going to pass to everybody and be a servant, you know. <laughs> and I'm going to be humble and I'm going to just... You know, love everybody, you know, and I would have these like pathetic games. Mm. And he goes, Mike, it's a game. Like, just compete as hard as you can. And as I got older, I learned that basketball was a, was a form of worship to God for me. So that changed that, that pursuit as well was that God created basketball for me and him to grow me closer to him not to pull me away from him. Mm-hmm. So there was a competitiveness there. Like I said, there were times when I felt like, okay, I should, I crossed the line here. Mm-hmm. But there was never a feeling like, um, unless I went intentionally or I said something, you know, trash talk, because trash talk was part of the game when I grew up. It's not now. Nobody trash talks anymore. But that was a part of the mental edge that you played with. Mm-hmm. And um, you could say some things that were, you know, borderline crazy. And, and, to have them said back, and you're having these conversations with Gary Payton and referees, and like that. I mean, it's just you know the the what you can imagine could go on there that's said at the highest and worst possible thing. Those things are being said, and how do you navigate that and not cross a line? I didn't learn later until later in life that you know basketball was there not so that I can make God known. He doesn't mm-hmm. need my help with that. There's billions of things around the world, galaxy, stars. He doesn't need me to help with that. He made it for us, for me and him. And I'm going to grow closer to him through basketball. When I saw that, my game elevated. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the game more. I, I did grow closer to the Lord. I got to know him better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was able to see it in that perspective. Interesting. 
I, uh, I hadn't heard you heard you share that be- before. I hadn't, don't know if I heard that at all that perspective, but I, I like that 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 is that's something that uh, is drawing us near because uh, sports is a great way, and this is what I always share uh, with people about youth sports is it gives kids a chance to fail, mm-hmm. and we just don't have that enough. Mm-hmm. You know, we're the the coddling, and you know, I think. And it's not only the failure, but it's how we respond to that, mm-hmm. you know, and I think having God as part of that, because like you said, I, I don't want anyone to miss that. Like you made mistakes, oh, you know, gosh, like the, yeah. there's, there's no doubt, like we can no love question. the Lord, you get between the lines and no man, question. okay, I went too far with that. Yep. I shouldn't, you know, no question. I shouldn't get into it with Gary Payton, you know, yeah. <laughs> that anybody. type of thing. Yeah. 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 And so that, that's a, that's a great, a great perspective to, to look at it as a game. And I think. You know, people that know you off the court, obviously, is that, you know, you're right. sometimes can be a different person. Right. I think that can be hard for celebrities, professional athletes, because we see this persona that the television mm-hmm. gives us. Mm-hmm. It's not who, who we really are. For sure. Um, but I think social media, in a way, has helped a lot in mm-hmm. that because you get to see behind the scenes good point. how popular sports are. I mean, the NBA is more popular in the off season now than it is <laughs> right. during the season because all the drama and different things that unfold. and. Right getting to know the person. So I think that, I think that helps in today's game, getting to know somebody just like just hit here in your heart now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's great. So I know your, your journey has obviously been a, a roller coaster, you know, mm-hmm. some NAI college ball, you know, you, you make the NBA, you win a title with the Lakers, you know, you get, you get cut, you're mm-hmm. playing in Italy. Uh, now you're back coaching in the NBA. So really a roller coaster. But as you look back on this, uh, on your basketball, I know there's a, a testimony that goes along with it. Mm. And so often we look at Mike Penberth and we've been talking about Mike Penberth, the basketball player, mm-hmm. but who, who came along, who was the person or persons that came along and was really that kind of mentor discipleship and help you with that owning your faith in your game. Cause it really mm-hmm. sounds like you, you took that serious as something you thought about. Yeah. Yeah. Who was that person? Um, well, it started with my father. I mean, he was a pastor's kid basketball coach teacher you know so he came out of the of the church so my mom was you know that's where the name Duncan comes from it's her maiden name so and he actually started the master's college so that was that was kind of his you know uh, gift to the world was he Mm -hmm. started it was LA Baptist College and I turned to master's when he moved on but he um you know I grew up as in the Christian home so um for me, my father and mother instilled in me just the importance of daily time in the Word, mm-hmm. daily prayer, uh, making it, you know, a discipline in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, that started there. That was the foundation from from there. After that, um, a guy named Ashley Noel um, became uh, a, a very important person in terms of the perspective of worship to God. Mm. And that Christ is your all all satisfying person that you are pursuing. Nothing else matters because I had reached the top of the mountain with the NBA and I wasn't satisfied. Mm. I didn't feel anything because the next day I had to go make the team. Didn't matter. The ring. What's the ring mean? Nothing. I got a ring. It's nice. It's great. But I ain't. I still got to make the team. That ain't gonna pay the bills. I ain't gonna you know move on. I'm 25 years old with a ring. You know NBA championship ring. So I reached the goals, but you're at the top of the mountain and there's nothing there. And I remember just thinking, okay, Christ is everything I need. And now I got to pursue that. And then I bumped into this guy, Ash, and he he changed everything for me, just understanding that God doesn't need me to make him. God needs you. He wants you, Mike. That's who he wants. And he doesn't want anything but you. He already knows about your gifts. He already knows all that. He wants you. And he wants the pain in your mm-hmm. life that you talked about. I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think there's anything. There's no growth without pain. Mm-hmm. None of that. And there was a ton of pain in my life. We, you know, all, all those years, there's more. But my dad passed away, the, you know, the year after I made the Lakers and won the championship. So, you know, you're going through difficulty. There, there's only pain. There's soreness in everything in life. That's a, that was the life of Christ, right? I mean, the perfect model is Christ. He, what happened? He ended up having to die. There's pain there, you know, in order to have that blessing. So... I always get a little nervous when, I'm, when I'm, things are going well because I'm thinking, okay, so there's some pain coming here because mm-hmm. that's how you grow in yeah. life. And um, so my father, my mother, and then this guy, Ash, really helped me. And he, he threw these questions on me. And I'm, I'm big into philosophy and thinking and theology. That was my major, was Bible exposition. So 
I would read, I still read, you know, a lot of the, the great thinkers and, and study that. And Ash came out of that. He was a, a fellow at Oxford. And so we had some, he would say, why do you play basketball? Hmm. And now I'm like, my head's spinning. Well, to, to glorify God, no. He would just go, no. Okay. And it would take me, you know, it would take me months to come up with an answer. So, you know, we would just work through that and he became a big influence in my life. That's cool. And Ash, Ash couldn't shoot a three to save his life, I bet. No, he could swim in a pool and he, could, he couldn't throw a ball anywhere near a basket. Yeah, really. yeah. Well, that's great and had a big impact on somebody who's spent his, his life around basketball. That's mm-hmm. cool. Um, so as you look back, I mean, you, you know, obviously saved at a young age and grew up in a Christian home and that... Um, how far you've come probably in your, your personal walk. We, we've heard a little of that. Mm-hmm. Um, was there anything else that, that really, I mean, it sounds like basketball and a few of these people in your life, anything else that really kind of had a, a big impact in you growing closer to the Lord and, and just that journey that, that you've been on with, with God? Yeah, I mean, having kids, you know, changes your perspective on God. You understand what it means that He's your Father. Because mm-hmm. um, you get what he sees in you, you see in your kids. You so know? good, yeah. So um, I see God differently because I have kids. Uh, being married and, and figuring out how to, to work and love and sacrifice and give of myself and die to myself. Yeah. Like how do you yeah. die to yourself, you yeah. know, when, when the world maybe has put you on a pedestal, but you come home, you guess what? You better, it don't matter. Yeah. yeah. She don't care. She knows everything about you. So... Um, that's a big part of it. Um, uh, my Bible major in college was a huge part of that. Mm. There's a knowledge there that's necessary, I think, to grow and an understanding of how it works and who Christ is and the pursuit of that is important. Yeah. Daily podcasts now. <laughs> that's yeah. what I listen to. I listen to John Piper and Francis Chan and Matt Chandler and, and uh, Ravi Zacharias and R.C. Yeah. Sproul. So I have podcasts on a daily basis because my schedule can be crazy with yeah. sometimes I don't make it to church but you know po- thank God for podcasts and YouTube yeah. I mean yeah. so those are big influences in my life currently yeah that's great I'm glad you you hit on that because I think it is not to, to glance over but you're still pursuing that no question like we're talking about you know you today but you're still pursuing the knowledge the growth and I think that's mm-hmm. an important aspect no matter where we're at there's been that constant in your life and mm-hmm. you realize that about yourself but you know hey I'm I'm, I'm seeking i'm growing i'm learning doing all that stuff and uh yeah we're going through that and how you know how, like you said how christ sa- uh, you would use the word sacrifice is what i was thinking mm-hmm. you know i mean with, with family and mm-hmm. kids and all that even your game mm-hmm. so am i going to go hang out with my buddies or am i going to go to bed early because i got to get a workout right. in the morning you know there's right. you know to, to be prepared for for what god has for you next what's your next whatever that dream is whatever god's put on your heart mm-hmm. uh so important so important uh okay so You've gone from player yeah. to coach. Right. Um, let's talk about current day a little bit. Yeah. So you're with the you you were uh, coaching with the actually let's go back to, to kind of your coaching because I think you were it's important to guys know like oh man he's in the NBA now he just he was a player and, and kind of now he's in the in the coach in the NBA that's not really how it went for you right you were doing a lot of personal training helping guys with their with their shot. Mm-hmm. Um, Walk us through kind of what that those couple of years were like, and then kind of really, you know, with the Timberwolves and now, now with the Pelicans, just just your niche and, and right. what, what you've been what you've been doing with the coaching. Yeah, it's uh, player development. It's um, I mean, I I worked basically with the help of a couple of guys in terms of like steering me in certain directions in terms of player development, my own personal player development, and then I practiced, you know, eight nine hours a day. So everything I learned and built, I took. Mike Pemberley, the no nobody out of high school to an NBA championship team, like there's a skill set that was developed there and kept developing. So, you know, you, you I would leave I would shoot every day and I would leave I wouldn't leave unless I made a hundred in a row. Now, there's not many guys in the NBA that can do that now. So there's there's very few. So that was that was a normal day for me. So I worked to that point. So I, I just have now taken those daily disciplines and, mm. and now I'm putting them into NBA players. Now it started with kids. I started a little youth program, and that was how I made my money by working kids out and, and youth. And so I started young. I was I was training. I started when I was sixteen, working out. You know, twelve year old kids trying to figure out a way to get them to shoot the ball better. And then so I learned how to teach and communicate and and trial and error. 
you know, a lot of those mm-hmm. things. And so the, the breeding ground, like if I, could, if I can teach a 12-year-old how to shoot, I can teach an NBA player. You know, if I yeah. can't teach a 12-year-old, I probably can't teach an NBA player. The, the reality is like the, the, the simplicity of explanation in terms of the mechanics has to be easy for a 12-year-old so that an NBA player is willing to say, I'm willing to forego what I know mm-hmm. and abandon what I've taught and listen to you. It has to be that simple and that clear. If it's not... He's not gonna trust me, mm-hmm. even if even if I'm a great shooter. But I can't communicate that yeah. clearly in a way that is obvious, where I'm in his head before he gets to those moments. Like I do that now. That's how I got Paul George, Chris Middleton, Kyle Korver, Reggie, like all these NBA players to buy because I could get into their head before they got to those points. And I would say, okay, right now you're gonna feel this uh-huh. because I know well, I did it. I yeah. know I wasn't a great shooter in high school. I became one. You know, I wasn't born one year. Nobody's born a good shooter. Good hand-eye coordination is great, but I wasn't a great shooter. And I, became, I built myself into one. So I knew what they were doing ahead of time. So I went from little kids and, and maintained doing that, got in with Andre Iguodala, did Dwayne Wade, and then it started to build. Reggie mm-hmm. Jackson and Paul George, and then just more guys started coming. Okafor and Luka Doncic has now been with me for four years. And so you start landing good, good, good players, and now – you realize Drew Holiday, you know, probably one of my favorite people on earth. Like, you learn how to talk to a guy who's a superstar, and and can your message, can you communicate your message, convey your message to help not only a 12-year-old kid, but a superstar become better? Yeah. How do you make those guys better? So shooting became the niche. It turned into more because obviously that wasn't what I was doing in Europe. I was doing more pick and rolls and driving kicks and more more complete skill set so it became more ball handling and mm-hmm. passing and reading and understanding defenses and the seven levels of a pick and roll and how to develop those issues so it gets deeper and deeper and deeper as we go but the only the superstars only a superstar can can understand those things because I can't tell a 12 year old that yeah you can say I'm going to shoot it or I'm going to shoot it <laughs> yeah. like that's his only <laughs> option but you know Drew Holiday is going to say okay there's seven options here in this pick and roll how are we going to figure this out and I can help him navigate that because I had to do it so that's where it's gone to now. That's really cool. So what's it like now sitting on an NBA bench? Mm-hmm. You know, you went with the Pelicans the last few years yep. and, and helping kind of more more of the team. What's You've been enjoying that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're learning the NBA game and kind of what, what would my system be. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm trying to put those pieces in place so that I can become a head coach. Hopefully someday get that opportunity. Just need to get interviewed and see where I can f- – I need to fail. Yeah. You know, in some <laughs> interviews. I need to fail. At some some you know applications you know and so um, uh, I'm studying under a great guy who really knows his stuff Chris Finch um, I've studied under Phil Jackson we ran John Wooden's offense that's why he came to our practices in college so I've, I learned a ton from him so I know the UCLA I know I know a number of offenses really well and now it's just kind of figure out what I would do yeah so you're seeing the game you know 82 games is a lot of games so you do that for a couple of years you see how the game flow how it works. What would what would and what wouldn't work? So you're just trying to put all that together. So hopefully I'll get the opportunity to do that. Um, there's a book to be written about that too. There's a lot of information mm. um, that you're trying to uh, chop down to, yeah. to to and then simply say, I need you to turn the corner on the next play. You know, like it was what what came through that filter is just yeah. a ton of information, and you're doing it in in session. So now with Drew, I, I speak. You know, Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis sit right in front of me, and I. And I just personally coach them. You should do this. Every time they touch the ball, I have a comment. So when you do this, you should have done this. You should have done that. What did you have me do there? What do you think about this? Like, so we're in game making adjustments. Reverse pivot on the catch. Don't don't front pivot. Front pivot on him. Go right. He's forcing you left. Break through his over arm. Get to a step back. Drew, you know, get to more step backs tonight. There's too many guys crowding the paint. Mm-hmm. Get off the ball early. Play on your second touch. You know, AD, you got to pe- kick out, repost, get to your fadeaways. So there's. There's always new information coming, yeah, at a deeper level. That now that the relationship is built close and, mm-hmm. and tight, I can have a, a direct influence on the game. And they're so good, they really yeah. don't need me. But it's nice to to be able to say, you know, hey, think about doing this. And other times they look at me, and go, what should I do? Just dribble right at him, has he shoot that three? Got it. Yeah. You know? And so they're so yeah. good, they can do that. Yeah. You know, so that's it's really fun. a tribute to that. And I know you enjoy that. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. yeah just it. breaking down that game, and it's it's fun. I think people don't. They they sit and watch. You know they love basketball. They they might understand some stuff. And when you when I hear you talk and breaking it down, mm-hmm. you know like that, uh, how deep the game goes and and what these guys are thinking about on mm-hmm. on on the court. Mm-hmm. So, 
Uh, you're the Pelicans general manager now. You have you have the first pick. Oh boy, I don't want that job. <laughs> I'm glad it's somebody else. Who who are you taking this year? Um, I mean Zion. It depends on what happens with Anthony Davis. You know, I mean if I'm if I'm sitting in that chair, I got to know what he wants to do, and if he wants to stick around, great. Then we'll that may uh, that may change what you do with that pick. Maybe you trade to get more guys, get maybe some more veterans. Maybe we try to get another All Star with that. Maybe we keep it and we try to build it around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Morant's a phenomenal player. Yeah, I mean, so you got some RJ Barrett's a really good player. You got you got some guys there that the league is turning to a more skilled league. It's not a super athlete league. Mm-hmm. It's a super skilled league. So, do you take into consideration those guys? I'm glad it's not my decision. <laughs> I don't know what I would do, but I can only imagine they're probably fielding thousands of, of phone calls from teams with different proposals on how can we get the. Yeah. We have the two most wanted players in the NBA right now. We have Anthony Davis and we have Zion Williamson. Like that that's yeah. what we have. Yeah. So everybody's gonna want to get those guys. So yeah. why not? I, I can only imagine that phone's probably ringing off the hook. Yeah. So I'm glad it's not me. I'm just <laughs> look, all I know is I'm glad we have Drew Holiday for sure next year. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's a big thing. Yeah. That's funny. Okay. So I know you have uh you got a couple boys playing ball. Mm-hmm. They still listen to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've tried not to be the guy who, like I told him all along, you guys can do whatever you want. I'm going to support and love. If you don't play basketball, then that's fine. Yeah, that's and great. when you do play, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clap and cheer. And when you make mistakes, I'm going to give you a hug. So yeah. not not interested in being the guy like that was barking orders at them. I said, if you want to know something from me, mm-hmm. you know, I've done this my whole life. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of trial and error and pain mm-hmm. that I've gone through to get to what I know. If you want to know, just ask me. Yeah. So now the relationship is a good one. You know, where I, yeah. it never was bad. It just, now they want to know more. They want to understand more. So that the the relationship is really good. Yeah, that's great. So if you're your, your uh, oldest is how old? He's 17, 18. 18 and you're middle? 16. 16. So if you're 18, who wins in a shooting contest? Between me and him? Yeah. Well, I don't miss. So When you're 18? No, not now. Oh, at 18? Oh, 18. He beats, oh, he beats. He beats if you. I'm 18? Yeah. And he's 18? Oh, he beats me. Okay. He beats but me easily. I wasn't yeah. that good. I know Ty 16 year old for sure. He's better than both of them. He's probably okay. better than Ty and me. That's fine. At 18? No, I was not. I was more of a point guard. I wasn't a good shooter at all. Yeah. Oof. Okay. Um, okay. Take us back. Before the 112 straight threes at Masters. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I know the, the answer to this, but who was who the biggest influence? Uh, not just spiritually or basketball, yeah. but, but in your life. Biggest influence in my life, yeah, probably my father. Yeah. Until I was 20, until he passed away. So, yeah. Yeah. How, so how do you deal with, um, you know, traveling now with your schedule? Mm-hmm. It's crazy. And you got three kids at home and, yeah. you know, get, they're getting older. So I, yeah. I know that is important to you as a father and, and a husband to be there. So what, mm-hmm. I know that, I know you wrestle with that. How do you, how do you Yeah, that? thank God for FaceTime. I mean, um, my kids and I talk more when I'm away than I'm, when I'm home because they can call me at any time. So I'm, yeah. I'm always available to them. My wife and I, we, we talk every day, FaceTime. I mean, it's, it's a running conversation. There's never a time we set. We just continue to, to do it, and I use FaceTime. So that's, that's how we do it, and um, it's, const- it's work to communicate. You know, it's work to keep a relationship. It's work to make it better. It's not um, something that just evolves into something good. We're fallen and, and selfish, and so we'll, we'll go our separate ways, but we have to work to maintain it. So... The truth about our relationship is that she's the key. It's like mm. she's amazing. So I couldn't do what I do without my amazing yeah. wife. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. All right. So we like to do something on the show. Mm-hmm. We do a little rapid fire. Dope. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this may be tough for me. <laughs> I'll keep it to one word answer. All right. We'll do we'll do slow fire. Okay. Okay. If you didn't uh, play basketball, what sport would you play? Baseball. Uh, most memorable shot you've ever made. Um. Probably in Europe, game winner uh, against the number one team in Europe from about thirty feet. I just I, I just held the ball for ten seconds and hezied from about thirty feet. It was it was Steph Curry before Steph Curry. Nice launch yeah. it. Okay, what's the uh, the shot that still haunts you that you missed? Uh, free throw to win the game in in. Berlin in the championships. I missed it. The guy got the rebound and made a three quarters court shot to tie the game. So if I'd made it, that would have been a four point. Yeah. We would have won. 
I missed the free throw. I was shot 91% that year, and I missed the free throw. And he made the three-quarters court shot, and they beat us in overtime. Wow. So I'll never forget that one. Yeah, that's a fresh wound still. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, what's your favorite thing to do on, a, on an off day? Golf. All right, I figured. Uh, who's your favorite all-time basketball player? Oh, Michael Jordan. Yeah. Okay, who in the last 20 years since you broke in the league, who do you feel like has been the most dominant player that you've played with or, or, or been around? Shaq, yeah. no question. Nobody could guard Shaq. Nobody. Never. And I saw Sabonis, 350 pounds. You know, there were, there were big Tim Duncan, David Robinson. He mowed through d -Vots. He mowed through all these guys. Every single one of those guys he destroyed. Tell us about, was it, uh, I don't know, the Western Conference Finals? Mm -hmm. You guys finally lost a game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we won, the, we won in the finals. We lost in the finals. Yeah. To Philadelphia. And then, and then Shaq comes back. Yeah. What was, yeah. What was his ad? I mean, he averaged like 40 and 20 yeah. after that. And he but, just took over. Yeah, he just uh, just threw me the ball. Like, he, we, we played against, <laughs> here's a good story. We played against um, David Robinson and Tim Duncan. And he said in the, in the timeout to us, just throw me the ball. I'm scoring every time. And every time he scored, he called Dave Robinson a name every time, and he dunked it four times in a row in the first quarter. Like, there was literally nothing he, you could do to stop him. So, yeah, he destroyed the tumbo. He, yeah. I mean, these are seven-foot guys that are 250, 300 pounds. Yeah. He just embarrassed them. So. Wow. All right, favorite city you uh, lived in while you are playing overseas? Oh, Napoli. Naples. Mm. Love it. I speak Sio Paolo Bene Italiano sempre. Yeah. Yeah, I miss Italy. I miss Italy. Yeah, I still dream in Italian. Really? Yeah, I speak it fluently. I was there seven years. So okay. Naples was. You guys been back since you stopped playing? Uh, no, I haven't been back. I'm looking forward to going back though. Cool. Uh, favorite golf course you ever played? Um, favorite golf is Koalao. I think that's in um, in Hawaii. I think it's called Koalao. It was one of the hardest courses I ever played. Anything off the fairway went into the jungle. It was like <laughs> jungle. It was like yeah. built into like a volcano. And every shot you hit, you could see off the volcano mountain. It was wow. absolutely beautiful. Play with the Lakers in training camp. Okay. It was fun. Favorite course you want to play that you haven't? Yeah, Pebble Beach for sure. All right. Definitely. All right. Can I come? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so current day, Pelican, Pelicans, who's your favorite player to coach? Drew Holiday. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's like a superhero. He's like a cartoon. You know, he's body, he can do anything you want. Like his body can, he can move and jump and he, like anything I tell him to do, he can do. So I feel like I'm like playing a video game. With him. He's, <laughs> Fun. he's amazing, amazing uh, person. One player that you really felt like you had a huge impact on helping them like develop their game, their, their, uh, you know, Paul, their George, Paul George for sure. About six years, six summers with him. Nice. Yeah. Um, why the bow tie? I like it. Yeah. But we want to know. Uh, the story behind it is, um, I was I, in Minnesota. I was um, getting ready to get dressed, and F Flip Saunders says, "Hey, you know, you're kind of the professor of our team. Like, guys go to you for questions, and you have answers. Why don't you? You're kind of the professor." And I was like, "All right, I'll try to figure out how do I work that. I gotta dress it." And he goes, <laughs> "How about you wear a bow tie?" I mean, Flip Saunders was amazing. He was an amazing man. And he goes, "Put a bow tie on." So I wore a board bow tie the first day. And he was like, yeah, there you go. And his son, Ryan, now new head coach, was like, oh, the professor. So he was, he was the one that kind of coined that name, but not the professor as you're in our, you know, our friend, the professor, but in a different light was because the players would always be like, hey, Mike, how do I do this? Or how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of the how-to guy. And I still am with our team. So that, that's, that was kind of my role. So that was how it became, hey, it's the professor. And now, then we won our first preseason game. Of course, we only won like 14 games that year. <laughs> it was a horrible year. And I was like, I'm not sure this is working. He was like, you got to wear one every game now. So I ended up having to buy, you know, more bow ties. And then people started sending them to me. So, oh, I, nice. to get, so I ended up having like 80 bow ties. Mike Penberthy, the basketball guy. That's right. That's right. B Bill, that Nye. Bill Nye. Yeah, you, need your, you need your own show. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Uh, so as a coach... <clears throat> As an athlete, like you, you really dealt in, in both of those both of those spaces. What would you tell somebody in that space uh, that's listening and watching about how you've connected 
God to your game? And we spoke on it a little bit, but what would be what would be some advice, some encouragement that that you would you would want to give somebody in that space trying to own their faith mm-hmm. within their game? You know, as as difficult as that is, even obviously mm-hmm. on the NBA level, but even on a high school level. Yeah, I think as in order to grow closer to God, in order to improve and grow at anything, it it takes work and a lot of work. So, um, hard work in basketball, hard work in your, in your spiritual life, hard work in your relationships. Like it takes work and, and in that is pain in that is suffering in that is growth. And it's a cycle that continues to grow throughout your life. So if you want to grow closer to God through basketball, you have to work at both God and basketball Mm -hmm. and then they merge and where they merge in your life, you find you know, new revelations of both, you know. So um, I think that's with any sport. It just takes work. It takes sacrifice. It takes discipline. It takes effort. It takes pain. It takes soreness. It takes growth. It takes work. It takes effort. It just keeps going, you know. And um, your spiritual life is, is, is exactly the same way. And, and like I said before, Jesus Christ's example is, is the way to see it. Dives in with people, lives a hard life, loves others, dies, yeah. and then comes back to life. Like, there's a cycle there that happens again. And so I believe it's the same with us. And I think that's how God set it up. Um, but it takes, um, it takes a ton of work and, and, a, and being willing to go through difficult times, knowing that God is in control, being willing to work at your game, knowing that you're going to come out on your side as a better player, even though you may suck or stink mm-hmm. <laughs> for a while. But knowing you're going to get better and pushing through that, I think I think that's part of how how God put it together. Yeah, that's good. I think we we got to work at it, mm-hmm. you know. And and eternity sports is a big big part of what we want to do is that mm-hmm. give people a platform to learn to glean from someone that's that's been through there uh, and obviously been able to to find to find success. And mm-hmm. and I, I would encourage people to find somebody to help alongside. Yeah. I mean, we should be helping people along the way. Um, but we need to make sure that we are being fed, you know, whether it's podcast, being in church, another, another believer on your team, you guys are, you guys are in that together. Uh, I think doing that alone can be hard. Um, I walked through that alone for a while when I first mm-hmm. found the Lord and, and mm-hmm. finding a way with your sport, coaching, playing, whatever that is. But I think that that word work, yeah. in other words, you, you really were, were hitting on with sacrifice. Those are those are real valuable things for us to, to not forget, mm. you know, because we can get caught up in the, ah, the way I'm feeling. Right. And we forget about up here and the things that we know and the promises of God. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's really good. Mm. All right. As we wrap, mm-hmm. uh, we'd like to ask everybody to turn us on to somebody you know that's, uh, that's playing for eternity. That's a professional athlete mm-hmm. and uh, that we can have on the show. What you got for us? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to talk to. Uh, I think Aaron Badley's a, a guy I'll call. Okay. PJ Tour, 20, yeah. 20 years on the tour, so. Yeah. Um, there's a number of other guys, but I'm gonna talk to Aaron. See okay. If, see if he can get on board with you guys. That'd be good. We love we love to have him. Yeah. And I know uh, I know you got a big golf tournament coming up. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. There. We're we're okay. recording this in the off season, mm-hmm. so you're not skipping practice. You're no. uh, Mike. Mike can hit the ball. A ton. He is, he's, he's an amazing, uh, amazing athlete, amazing athlete. I appreciate you sharing today, being on the show, just letting people see, you know, I know everyone wants to talk basketball and Shaq and Kobe and Mm -hmm. Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday. But I think, uh, you run so much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, guys look at you and I think they see, uh, the authenticity Mm -hmm. and I think they, they see a guy who loves the Lord and, and they want to be around and, and I want to, Keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. All right, you bet. Thank you. <laughs>